The AMD Athlon 200GE CPU enters our benchmarking charts today, but we're reviewing this one with a twist. For this benchmark, we're testing the CPU entirely as a CPU, ignoring its integrated graphics out of curiosity instead to see how the $55 part does when coupled with a discrete GPU. To further this, we overclocked this supposedly locked CPU to 3.9 GHz using multiplier overclocking, something that shouldn't work and which is disabled on almost all of the motherboards for the AMD AM4 family, at least for Athlon 200GE series parts. In this instance, the 200GE at 3.9 GHz posts significantly improved the numbers over stock, making it a candidate to replace the retired price position once held by the Intel Pentium CPUs, at least up until the 14 nanometer shortage. Before that, this video is brought to you by the Gigabyte AMD RX 580 and RX 570 mid-range video cards. Gigabyte's Aorus RX 570 now starts at $150 US on some retailers, offering an affordable gaming solution for high settings and 1080p. These cards now come with your choice of games, picked between Resident Evil 2, Devil May Cry 5, and The Division 2. You can pick two of three. Learn more at the link in the description below. This is a $55 part. We know it has an IGP in it. It's got a Vega integrated graphics solution. We've looked at the R3 2200G, the R5 2400G in the past, and they're interesting, but they deserve kind of special standalone benchmarking that's a bit different from our standard CP benchmark suite. What we're interested in is seeing, is the Athlon 200GE a good replacement for where the G3258 once sat, for where the G4560 once sat, because Intel now, it's Pentium, G series, like the G5600, for example, and the 5400, they're way too expensive. They're like 100 plus dollars, which is really where i3 territory used to be and should be. So to see Pentium class CPUs north of $70, $80 is pretty disappointing because there needs to be a good replacement. That 3258 used to be something like a $50, $60 part, and you just can't get that anymore. So that market's lacking. That's where we're looking at the 200GE today. And we're also overclocking it. So that's where it gets a bit more interesting because we tested the 200GE on every vendor's motherboards. We tested it on Asus and with the Crosshair 7 Hero, which is completely different price category, that motherboard, it has the multiplier unlocked and it's got voltage unlocked. But in reality, when you set the multiplier, it'll set, it'll apply. Once you get into Windows, it just ignores it. So you can set 3.9, but it doesn't do anything. And that's with the newest BIOS updates. Then we tried Gigabyte. And with Gigabyte, we tried the B350 motherboard. I think it's AB350, something like that. And uh, Gaming 3 board, same problem there. It's, it's locked. And the CPU is supposed to be locked by AMD. So they're following the spec. The Gigabyte board uh, just doesn't even show you the multipliers. It's a bit different there. And then finally, ASRock, same thing. Doesn't apply the multiplier, even if you set it. So then we found out that MSI, we used the B350 Tomahawk for this Zen 1 architecture part uh, with the newest BIOS. And we found out that MSI with a GISA version 1.0.0.6 does allow you to do multiplier overclocking on the 200GE, which is really exciting because you can push it a lot harder with multiplier overclocking. It's just product segmentation at the end of the day, which is interesting because that was the whole pitch AMD made when they came out with Ryzen saying, well, look, you can overclock any of our parts. We're not artificially segmenting it like Intel. Now, realistically, every company segments their parts artificially because you can't survive otherwise. But that was the pitch, and it didn't apply some reason to the 200GE because they want to introduce more of them later. And then finally, for differences between the R3-1200, the R3-1200 and the Athlon 200GE, we compare a lot in these benchmarks. And it's important to know why the performance gaps emerge that do because they're both technically four thread parts. It's just that one of them is two cores, four threads, and one is four cores, four threads. Now, typically, under, for example, Intel's architecture, uh, you might not see that big of a difference between two core, four thread, and four core, four thread in some games. But here we're seeing a big difference, and that's because a lot of the die on the 200GE is being allocated to a GPU, which we are not using in these tests. And because it's allocating that much die space, which is limited to a GPU, you end up with about half of the cache. This is really important. So you've got level one, level two, level three cache. L1 cache sits the closest to the CPU cores and is the most important. It's also the smallest because naturally, uh, as you kind of close in on a square, you get smaller and smaller towards the center. There's less space towards the center. And so obviously it follows that there would be less space 
for L1 cache, which sits near the center. And that L1 cache, it's SRAM, it's static RAM, uh, it's extremely fast, it's also extremely small. So on the 1200, you end up with 384 kilobytes of L1 cache, you end up with one megabyte uh, of L2 on the 200 GE, but two megabytes of L2 on the 1200, and you end up with four megabytes of L3 on the 200 GE, and eight megabytes of L3 on the 1200. And then finally, back to L1, 384 kilobytes on the 1200 versus 192 on the 200 GE. That's a big difference, aside from the core difference and aside from the uh, the memory limitations, the memory controller, the memory uh, speed you can get on the 1200 versus the 200 GE. F1 2018 uses the Codemasters Ego engine and unlike a lot of other games we test, pushes extremely high frame rates that rarely become GPU bound. This is good for CPU benchmarking. At 1080p high, F1 2018 positions the Athlon 200GE at 107 FPS average when stock, with 64 FPS for 1% lows. Overclocking the 200GE to 3.9 GHz boosts it to 124 FPS average, a climb of 16%. In terms of frame times, that's a move from 9.3 millisecond average frame times to an 8 millisecond average frame time. Comparatively, an AMD R3 1200 4 core 4 thread stock CPU ends up at 144 FPS average with an overclocked variant at 163 FPS average. If you're willing to overclock the 200 GE, it does start to inch towards the R3 1200 stock CPU, but manages to do so at half the price. For an ultra budget build, this might be an okay choice. More importantly, the G5600 is Intel's closest competition, and its price is simply too high to be worth considering at $100 plus. These Pentiums should be closer to $70 to $80, like they were in the past, where they'd actually make some sense, especially for the price to performance ratios we're looking at. Here's the frame time plot for F1 2018. For frame times, remember that lower is better, but more consistent is better than lower. For every spike you see in the frame to frame interval, that's a longer period of time between the previous frame and the current frame, and the interval between frames becomes noticeable to the user, particularly close to those 40 millisecond spikes, which are perceived as stuttering. The 200 GE overclocked to 3.9 gigahertz does it well overall, with a consistently lower frame times than the stock version, and the lengthened line also illustrates more overall frames rendered. If we plot the overclocked 1200, you'll see the consistency of the red line is overall improved versus the 200 GE, showing the best experience of the three plotted devices, although it's also about two times the price, so that makes sense. But this gives you a picture of what the individual frames look like in the game. Each one of those lines is a frame, and what you want is them to be as consistent and flat as possible while still being low on the on the scale. You want it to be closer to, for example, 16.67 milliseconds would be 60 FPS. At 1440p, the stack is similar. We lose some frame rate off the top, but overall performance is nearly identical. That's because we're not changing anything in the environment that stresses the CPU, and instead focusing on imposing a GPU limitation at the top end of performance. But that requires the CPU is able to keep up, which these low end ones can't. These results are functionally the same as at 1080p as is scaling versus the R3 and Pentium CPUs. Assassin's Creed Origins gives us a look at a popular series that likes frequency, but also leverages core count more heavily than most other games on the market. This is made evident by positioning of the 7980XE and 7960X CPUs, which often have a frequency deficit, but a core advantage. At 1080p medium, the Athlon 200GE also illustrates this core and cache demand at the low end, we're bottlenecked down to 41 FPS average when overclocked to 3.9 GHz, a 9% lead over the stock 38 FPS average of the 200 GE. The G5600 is able to lead at 52 FPS average with its increased frequency, but still struggles when compared to other CPUs on the market. The R3 1200 stock CPU ends up at 53 FPS average, an increase over the 200 GE's 38 FPS average of about 8 milliseconds average frame to frame interval. That's noticeable here, and overclocking the R3 1200 further assists in playability, bringing the average frame rate up to 59 FPS average for a total frame to frame interval average of 16.67 or so milliseconds. None of the lows or frame time consistency uh, plots suffer disproportionately from the averages in this lineup, it's just that the averages are low overall for the 200 GE. Decreasing geometric complexity would assist here as would draw distances, but there's only so low that you can go in the settings before there's just nothing left that you can tune down. 
1440p doesn't change anything for Assassin's Creed, of course, except for the chart-topping CPUs like the 9900K and 7980XE. At the low end, performance and scaling are identical as at 1080p. We are heavily CPU bound by these low end products and playability of Assassin's Creed does suffer with the $55 AMD Athlon 200GE CPU even when overclocked. It could be done on the lowest settings, but doubling the budget to an overclocked R3 1200 boosts the average frame time from a dismal 27 milliseconds to an acceptable and fully playable 17.3 millisecond average frame to frame interval. Far Cry 5 has had some odd frame time performance in some CPUs lately, something we've illustrated time and again with the 9600K test variability data we presented in our 9600K review. We're just now starting to dig into Far Cry's odd performance behavior as it reminds us of the GTA 5 bug we discovered a year or two ago, where some CPUs would hit the engine's frame rate cap and then stutter hard as they bounced off of the frame rate cap. In essence, the GTA 5 bug meant that higher frame rates resulted in worse frame times and a worse experience, but only for the quad-thread i5 CPUs of the time. We're digging into Far Cry 5 to see why it behaves in similar ways, so for now, we're only going to show the average and 1% lows until we have a better and fuller picture of what's going on at the low end of those frame times. At 1080p normal, the Athlon 200GE stock CPU ends up at about 62 FPS average, which is playable and has reasonably consistent frame times for a $55 part. Overclocking with the MSI board helps significantly, boosting us to 71 FPS average. The R3 1200, for perspective, leverages its additional die space for cache and physical core as well, running at 81 FPS average stock and 92 FPS average when overclocked to 3.9 GHz. The G5600 operates at 85 FPS average, continuing to prove an overall poor value at its current variable price point of roughly $100. At 1440p, the same sort of scaling appears. We have some fluctuations in frame rate, but given that only the chart toppers hit a GPU bottleneck, there's not much movement at the low end of the chart. Civilization VI offers a unique and entirely different look at CPU-bound computational workloads for real gaming scenarios, like turn-based strategy games and grand campaign games where AI players calculate thousands of possible actions. For Civ VI, the AMD Athlon 200GE really suffers. Its average turn resolution time is 24.6 seconds, meaning that a game with five AI players will, upon clicking your end turn button, take 123 seconds, two full minutes, until you can play again. For an extreme example, the 7980XE at 4.6 GHz would take 56.5 seconds, or roughly half the time, to process the same five turns with its 11.3 second per turn average. Overclocking the 200GE fully demonstrates why we say Civ 6 still prefers frequency for its largely single and dual thread dependent crunching, where our performance climbs to a 21 second turn time average. This is a turn time requirement reduction of 13.4% per turn, which is absolutely noticeable. Moving to the R3 1200 stock CPU doesn't provide much value against the overclocked 200GE, but does provide a significant turn time reduction of 17% against the 200GE stock. Overclocking the R3 1200 to 3.9 GHz propels it to an 18 second turn time. For these two CPUs, we're looking at Zen 1 architecture on both the 1200 and the 200GE, with differences at 3.9 GHz being a higher core count of four cores, four threads, rather than two and four on the 1200, alongside a massive difference in cache. The R3 1200 has more die space allocated to the CPU components. There's no IGP here and that allows for extra physical cores and the 384 kilobytes of level one cache alongside two meg of level two cache and then eight megabytes of level three cache. Level one is the most important as it's the SRAM closest to the cores or static RAM, which is why the 200 GE's 192 kilobyte L1 cache is such a punisher in these types of titles. The 200 GE has half the cache across all three levels as compared to the 1200, not to mention a more limited memory controller. Blender is 100% unintended for the Athlon 200 GE processors, clearly, but we ran it through the workload anyway, just for some fun. We don't have the other low-end CPUs here to compare because we don't have 10 weeks to wait for them to finish rendering, but we do have the 200 GE just for some perspective. So the 200 GE as a mixed workload part that may occasionally be used for 3D rendering is, as expected, completely against our recommendation. It took 145 minutes to finish our GN logo single frame render, although overclocking aided significantly against that time horizon to bring down render time to 119 minutes. That's an 18% time reduction, but the R5 2600 destroys the 200GE's performance at 39 minutes to do the same work. It's more expensive, but if you're doing this type of work regularly, 
it really is worth trying to skip a few meals to afford a better CPU. It'll be worth it. So as for how this thing does, it's a pretty good replacement for where the G4560 and G3258 once stood. They were strong parts that if you didn't want an APU, which is a, a perfectly valid thing to not want, but you had a, a really strict budget of less than 150 bucks to spend on your CPU and your GPU, those two CPUs made a lot of sense. But they are no longer really, uh, 45, 60, you can kind of get around that price. It's just kind of old. Uh, it's like 80 bucks, still too expensive. And for the most part, it's not worth it. The 5600 should have taken its place or the 5400, but at time of writing this content, uh, Newegg in the US had those prices as a, at, at about $100, plus or minus 20, depending on which part you're looking at. Well, not even minus, just plus 20 sometimes. So 100 minimum, we saw them up to 120. It's just crazy. The reason those prices have gone up is because there's a, sh a severe shortage of 14 nanometer parts. Intel's not making a lot of them uh, and there's demand for them, so retailers have room to price them up. But that means they're not really suitable at their price points. You're better off with like a 1200 and overclocking it, for example, or going the next step up and getting an R5 or an i5 or something even. So then, to really fill the true budget class, the 200GE does well. Even if you're not going to use the IGP, if you're just buying a dirt cheap CPU that's not garbage and coupling it with a non-garbage cheap GPU, like 1050, uh, if you can find it, a really cheap 1050 Ti or an RX 550, 560, something like that, it's a good CPU for those combinations. We haven't worked with the IGP yet, so can't speak to that side of things, but I can tell you it's not going to be that powerful. The R3-2200G, if you want something cheaper than a $55 CPU and a $100 GPU, the 2200G comes in 50 bucks cheaper than that. It's a really good part. We like it a lot. It is limited, of course, but if you overclock the GPU, the CPU, it does pretty damn well on its own. It's just a better CPU for, or APU for something like Overwatch or uh, CSGO or something like that. So those kind of esports titles, Rocket League. And if you're curious about that part, check our your recap of the best CPUs of 2018 because we gave it the 2200G an award for the best budget gaming CPU and you can find information on that in that content. So overall, Athlon 200GE, hopefully MSI doesn't pull that BIOS and if they do, we'll make it available to you. But hopefully uh, AMD can officially adopt this overclocking support of the 200GE because it is supposed to be locked, but it's just so much better when you overclock it to 3.9 gigahertz and it's trivial, it takes like zero effort and the power draw isn't even really worth talking about. We do have numbers for it, but it's just, it's in, insubstantial, really. So that's it for this one. Uh, you can find links in the description below, as always. So the written article will be there. Product links will be there for some of the relevant products from this, if you want to pick one of those up. And go to store.gamersnexus.net to pick up a shirt like this one or one of our mod mats. And you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out as well. Subscribe for more. I'll see you all next time.